Yatketan, Yatketan will continue with our next speaker. Seuraavaksi meille puhuu täällä kostarikalainen tutkiva journalisti, datajournalisti Janina Sengini, is that right? Good. Uh, joka on täällä Suomessa tutkivan journalismin yhdistyksen vieraana ja sitä kautta sitten onnekkaasti saatiin myös meille tänään puhumaan. Ja hän on siis tota, palkittu pitkän linjan tutkiva toimittaja ja puhuu meille aiheesta um, Zero, waste Zero Waste Data Cookie. Indeed. So Janina, the floor is yours and then uh, after your talk we're going to do a Q&A and people can ask you questions and, and that. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Johanna, and I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I don't want to brag with you guys, but I was 40 degrees at the beach three days before yesterday. <laughs> uh, so let's try to find some warm. Well, um, I'm a journalist, basically. I wanted to study, I wanted to become an, um, an engineer. So I became a journalist and I suddenly mixed both lives, both worlds. And um, it used to be called uh, uh, computer assisted reporting. Uh, back a days, but now it's called data journalism. I have my doubts about this term, but uh, the fact is that I run the investigative unit at La Nación, which is the largest news newspaper in Central America. And um, we were three journalists, uh, basically covering corruption, organized, organized crime issues. Um, and uh, during the last uh, 18 years, we've been uh, publishing stories that uh, sent to jail three former presidents of the country. And um, after that, we were kind, kind of boring. And two years ago, we started this project that became uh, unique in the world because uh, we've been collecting data, public databases from everywhere, scraping the web um, and collecting databases and consolidating all, all this uh, information in the server. And we've been investigating still corruption issues and uh, organized crime uh, stories based on all of this data. So if the term may sound a little bit weird, database, uh, zero waste data cooking, and that's because I think data journalism, it's like cooking in terms of you need ingredients, kitchen tools, and of course talent and creativity in order to, to cook well. And uh, to do data journalism, you also need uh, data, which is like the ingredients, programs, and talent and creativity as well. So I hope you're not really hungry because we're gonna talk about food a little bit. <laughs> and uh, we're, uh, I'd like to compare cooking and data journalism in three different levels. Uh, in the first level, when you're cooking, you have basic uh, tools like a stove, and then you collect uh, basic ingredients like a kit, like a chicken and spices. And you can cook a uh, roast chicken. But if you don't have creativity and if you don't use the data you collected, uh, so everything is going to go to waste, or maybe your pets will have some of, of the leftovers. In level one, when you're uh, working with data, maybe you can have uh, an idea to collect. This is a, a, a traditional computer-assisted reporting plate. It's, it's actually a story that we published uh, like three, two and a half years ago. Then what we did is that we collected uh, the whole database of candidates who were running for mayors. And uh, we also collected the, the whole database of criminal court records in the country. And another one of people who were forbidden to occupy public positions. And another one of people who didn't pay their taxes. So we basically compared the three databases, and we uh, cross-referenced uh, the three of them. And after cleaning, indexing, and normalizing the, the data, the outcome was that uh, five guys who were running for mayors were uh, sentenced of kid kidnapping, fraud, and robbery. And 27 of them had been forbidden to occupy public positions, and even though they were running for, for mayors. 
So this is the story we published, uh, and and I love this story because even it, it was the, it was the first time the first time we uh, did um, data journalism uh, in a regular basis. Uh, the good thing about this is that we published the story a week before the elections, with an interactive map uh, where every citizen could go and, and, and find uh, the, the candidate of their regions and find for their local angels. But even though uh, this was uh, a really, really good story, most of these guys were not elected, of course. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say that uh, it was because of our publication, but, but <laughs> the fact is that even this story, if we don't use the data that we collected before, this is going to waste. So there's a level two in cooking, and in level two you have more tools like mixers and microwave uh, and many other tools. But you also start thinking in a different way. So during the weekend, uh, we still have the same chicken, but during the weekend we, we think, okay, maybe we can cook a red curry sauce or a chipotle sauce. And during the weekdays, with the same chicken, instead of having leftovers, you will have a chicken quesadilla or an exotic Thai salad. In level two, using data, you start to think that there are no leftovers. So any data set is a new ingredient. <coughs> and so for instance, the criminal court records that you, we used before, we can, we can think, for instance, how many active teachers have been sentenced of pedophilia? And so we, we can cross-reference both uh, uh, data sets. And also with the, with the other one of people who don't pay taxes, they are not supposed to be getting contracts from the government. Uh, so you can, you can uh, use, again, every single data set you have. But there's a level three in which uh, I like to, um, it's not that I'm not a good cooker, okay, but I love the, <laughs> to compare it with cooking. In molecular gastronomy, as maybe most of you know, it's, a, it's like the science uh, it, it mixes science and cooking and to discover the physical and chemical processes that occur while, while you're cooking. And this thing that you see there is a smoking gun. And basically what it does is that you fill the smoking gun with uh, wood chips and so you smoke the, the same chicken and you have smoked uh, chicken that tastes as uh, wood. So now you don't you have not just the supermarket to cook, but also you have the forest. And that's exactly what happens when, when you go to level three in data journalism. Uh, and that's what I call zero waste journalism or data cooking. So imagine every data set that you have collected and, and you link uh, every data set with, with each other. That's exactly what we, what we have been doing. So we started by having the whole data set, the whole database of people, Costa Ricans first, and now we have foreigners also. And uh, we have uh, properties, vehicles, uh, what else, subsidies, licenses, uh, sanctions, contracts from the government. Um, now we have more information uh, consolidated than, than the information the same government has. Uh, and it's only after two years. And what we do, we are, well, this is the software we're using uh, to analyze the data. It's called i2. This is a video that shows a query that we do in, uh, and basically um, we are asking the query, it, 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 what it's doing is asking how many persons or, or people have a license to operate as a private guard and uh, we can uh, precise the dates from when, when they got the license. And we are asking also how many of them have been sentenced of anything and if they are part of a criminal uh, process. And also we can ask, uh, this is the way it looks, the, the, the software we use. We want to know how many of them have been um, 
have been actually been found guilty. Um, so when the query finishes, what we are going to have is the current people who are working as a private guard, and, and they also have been found guilty in some other process. So the results are uh, basically eight people, and uh, once we finish to, to delimitate what we want, we see the eight names, and so we expand one of them, and we can see uh, I mean, everything related to the uh, criminal process, uh, to the criminal case, and we can also see the, the uh, sentence uh, in, 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 in this case, this is a guy who used to be a policeman and he, he basically stole some equipment from the government. And so he, he was found guilty and even though he's, uh, he received a license as a private guard like months be, uh, after that. What was the name of the program? I2. I2. It's a oh, British I2. software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it, yeah. it's used um, mainly by uh, law enforcement agencies, FBI, CIA and every single, and, and it's not normal for journalists to use this kind of software, it's like an in, intelligence based. Uh, so the thing with this is, I mean, we can use any other software. Um, if I had to start again, probably I wouldn't buy this because it's quite expensive. But the, the good thing about this, uh, having all this information stored and consolidated is that, for instance, this case, this guy who, who you see there, I don't know how many of you have heard about Facundo Cabral. He was a, um, a very famous singer from Argentina, and he was killed in Guatemala by uh, an organized crime um, group. And so the main suspect is uh, Costa Rican, and when we got uh, his name in the newsroom, like at 4 p.m., uh, it turned out that his name, uh, there was another guy named uh, the same as him, but he used to be the, um, the, the manager of the year, uh, three years in a row. So almost all the journalists confused his name and, and actually two of them published uh, uh, wrongly that he was the suspect. But we got the ID and in one minute and a half we had this map which basic, basically shows all his connections. And so you can see there uh, his father, his uh, mother, uh, their, their kids, and when he was married, uh, his house and everything. So we're not only using this information uh, for large uh, investigative pieces, but also uh, in a regular basis for any kind of story. Mm -hmm. This is a recent story we published. It, this was back in March this year. And uh, it probably shows uh, better uh, how are we using data. This guy used to be the finance minister in the country. And uh, it turned out that um, during a, a very, um, in the middle of a, a critical debate about a fiscal reform in our country, we thought, okay, is there any other way that we can cover this story different than what other media are doing? So what we did is we uh, created a database of all the properties. There's a, there's a tax in Costa Rica, uh, a property tax that everybody has to pay. And every five years you have to declare your property and the, the value of your property and, and you get, uh, and, and you have to pay uh, according to, the, to that amount. So we collected the, every single property under the names of, this, uh, of the ministers of of the country, the president, the two vice presidents, 17 congress members, and 24 ministers. ministers. And we also uh, added their wives' and husbands' properties, because as, as you may know, uh, normally the, the properties are not under the name of, of, of the politician. And also we collected the, the names of the companies uh, that they own. And uh, what we did is that we compared the declared value of the properties and the real value. The real value, we got it from the, um, the finance uh, ministry. They have a database of the current value of the property in each part of the country. So we basically compared the both, both values and we found out that half of the ministers were not, were not paying their taxes. They were not declaring their properties as the, as 
they were supposed to. And by the time we published the story, uh, since we have to call them in advance, almost all of them, they were running and, and paying what they were own. Uh, so this is the story. And the worst, worst case was the finance minister, the guy who was pushing for the new uh, uh, legal reform. He had five properties and he was not paying, uh, he was not declare, declaring the value of the properties uh, for the last 12 years. And uh, one of the properties actually, when we went uh, to the field to see the, the, the property, the house, we found the police department. And so it was kind of weird. We went to the security ministry and found out that he was renting his house to the security ministry. ministry. And so in, in order to get the rent, uh, the calculation for the rent was based on uh, $300,000 amount. But in order to pay taxes, the value was declared only in $40,000. $40, so uh, after this, this was the main publication. He had to resign and, and actually two more ministers had to resign. This is an um, interactive application that there was a lot of, uh, we, we had a lot of discussion here because this application basically showed every single property of, of every minister and uh, we knew that they were, they were going to complain about um, uh, having uh, in a map every single, every single property. But uh, at the end, since this is public information in our country, we decided to, to run the, the application it's a shame that there's no internet, but it looks like that. Well, uh, he had to resign, and then uh, there was uh, there was uh, another investigation after this, but it was not based in, on on data. We got uh, more. Um, we we had access to the tax uh, system, and he was not only avoiding uh, the property taxes, but also the income taxes. Um, okay. We are uh, three reporters and two computer science engineers. I've been doing this on my own since 1999, so this is not something that comes like easily. Uh, I went to court five times since 1999 to 2003, and after we won every single case in court, uh, now we are able to go and ask for databases. Uh, not easily. But the, the, the challenge we're facing now is that they are charging us uh, crazy amounts, like half a million dollars for a database. So we're going to court again and um, fighting for, for to have access, access to the information. So how, how are we working? What we do is that we collect data from different sources. One is that we are scraping the web 24-7, seven, so we have kind of from eight to 10 robots running, especially during the night, because we don't want to compromise the, uh, any of the, of the sources that we're scraping. And uh, we also, I mean, I go and have appointments with the ministers. I went to speak to the president of the country and said, I mean, this is a very transparent project. We are doing this, collecting data in order to investigate. After the minister's story, she's not very happy about this, but, uh, but we also, uh, now we are connected to web services directly uh, with two public institutions. We have an agreement that uh, we, we are directly connected to, to the database so we can actualize the information in, in, in real time. And we have, we are working on two more agreements uh, that we are proposing them to de develop the, the web service in order to, uh, in exchange uh, for the, of the information. And uh, okay, all this information comes and we basically clean it. At the beginning, it was very manual. And now it's very automatized. Um, that we have integrated, for instance, the seven algorithms of Google Refine to an e ETL uh, system in which uh, the whole process is automatic. And so all this information goes to a, a server and a physical server that we have in a data center. And then the analysis process uh, starts, that is basically what I showed you before. And of course, this is not, this never replaces uh, reporting, traditional uh, investigative reporting. We have to go to the field, 
and confirm every single uh, fact that we find after we cross-reference the data. And uh, the output at the end is basically, we have a print version, uh, the newspaper, and also a web uh, version. So we try to, to work on, on infographics, special infographics, infographics for the, for the print, and uh, interactive uh, applications for the web. This is the, the scraping process. This is, a video that, this is a video that shows how are we scraping the web. So this, this is a, a web page where every single lawyer is registered. Uh, so we basically uh, program a script. Uh, we are using iMacros, which is a, a commercial software, but very, very easy to use, uh, .NET and Java. And uh, what we do is that we collect every single bit of data, uh, and we have every single lawyer uh, in our database, and, and their pictures, and every, every uh, information that is available. What, what happens is that, um, I think you, you know about CAPTCHA, uh, okay, that's our main challenge, but nowadays it's not so complicated to skip CAPTCHAs. <laughs> <laughs> if you pay, um, it's like a dollar for every thousand records, you can skip CAPTCHA easily. Uh, but we, we are not using that on a regular basis, only for, for data that we really, really want to have. So why we journalists have to complicate our lives doing this kind of, uh, of, of, of processes? I have three, uh, at least, uh, in my opinion, we have three reasons to start doing this sort of uh, investigative reporting. The first one is to overcome the filtration dependence. Uh, the second one is, of course, to fulfill the, fulfill the thirst of value and to enhance and expand the business, business model. This filtration dependence, uh, many of you guys, uh, reporters, may have experienced something like this. Like uh, last night, while we were all sleeping, there were many, many things going on in our neighborhoods, in our um, countries. And what happens all the time is that a um, few weeks or months after these events, somebody will come to our newsroom with a small piece of, of this event. And uh, he or she will come because maybe they, don't, they didn't receive a commission or, or or, or a benefit, and so you will have a story to start with, and then if you're so good, you will collect more pieces, and at the end, you will have a great, great story to tell. But the question is, the missing pieces, could they have changed the whole story? And this is a question that has uh, bothered me for, for a long, long time. Uh, every time we publish a story, we think that that's the whole thing. And if it comes from, from a, a filtration, uh, there is somebody interested uh, in, in, in making you uh, publish this story. So uh, this image basically uh, is, shows what we reporters can become. We can become a, a rabbit chasing a carrot. And, um, I don't know here, but in my country, which is a small country, there are many, many experts in seducing our sense of smell. So we think that we are really tough and smart, but what happens is that we are chasing this carrot that somebody else is, is putting. So the second reason is uh, to fulfill the thirst of value. As you know, there, there is a lot of information in, 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 on the web. And, um, well, this is actually not updated, but uh, there are more than, more than eight, 800 exabytes uh, of data available. And uh, it's very noisy. There is too much data and too much aggregation, especially uh, news. I don't know how many of you have tried, but every, every time that there's a, a, a breaking, breaking new story, I mean, if you start using your Twitter and, and Facebook, Every single story is the same. It's the same thing. And different, um, uh, there, there is less intelligent information. So uh, in our newsrooms, what is happening is that the editors are, are really, really obsessed by having us
covering the story uh, by video and uh, tweeting and, and social networks and, and basically using every single uh, platform to communicate the, the story. But uh, there is not uh, much, inf uh, much uh, interest in increasing value for our readers, our audience. And I think this, uh, this kind of journalism uh, actually enhances uh, and, and adds value. And of course, it it's expands um, the virtuous circle, which is that if you have credibility, if you, if you do uh, quality journalism, you will have credibility and that will allow you to have more audience. And more audience attracts more advertising. advertising. And that brings more money to pay for independence, and then the circle goes on and on. So data opens uh, up new opportunities. Uh, as you know, data is uh, is now is it's now considered a capital resource as human resources, uh, and there are many many options. But the question would be, does it enhances credibility? for our readers, for our media. These guys, Thomson Reuters, they understood very early and, and basically um, where everybody, while well, everybody and every other media outlets were losing money, they were earning uh, lots, lots of money. And this, this is the way we see our, our agenda. We are still doing fil filtration, uh, filter-based investigations, which is the, the, the right part of, the, of this graphic. But we are dedicating most of our time to uh, collect uh, public information, individual records uh, from people, companies, and, and, uh, and, and working with this data and finding, uh, unfolding uh, investigative stories. And we are also working with uh, statistical data. Um, like for instance, this month we published a story about the high schools. We collected every single database of, of the performance of high schools, uh, public and private. And uh, we demonstrated, we didn't, you didn't have that problem here because you have the best ed education in the world. But um, in our country, the private education is it's better than the public one. Uh, so we demonstrated that uh, the uh, students from public high school high schools uh, had half of opportunities to get into the university, and well, that was mainly working with uh, with data. So there has been a lot of obstacles, of course. Uh, the good thing about this this is so crazy. I mean, the, um, the two journalists I work for, uh, with are like old dinosaurs, investigative journalists, 50 years old. And these two boys, the, the developers, they are like 24, 26 years old. So when we were working on the story about the former presidents, they were in the, in the school. They don't even remember anything. And uh, they didn't used to read the newspaper at all. And so what we had in mind, what I had in mind with this uh, experiment, that is not an experiment, that experiment anymore, was trying to have this specimens, uh, different, completely different people living together in a small room. It's a, I mean, it's a shame that I didn't film what happened uh, during the last two years, but it was, it was so crazy. And suddenly, uh, reporters uh, started to become a little bit geek, and, and developers uh, are, are uh, I mean, they, at the first two months, they wanted, uh, they wanted me to take them out of the office because it was too noisy and too crazy. You know, the newsroom is always like that. But now, uh, the, the synergy has, has been a, a real success. Uh, so adaptation was a problem. It's not that much nowadays. And this is a real problem because I, I, we thought about everything but in what happens when you, for instance, the, the story of the mayors, when we had 400 names matching something wrong, what do you do? Well, we had to set up a, a call center to call every single candidate and ask for their version. Because uh, as you know, that's one of the basics in journalism. We have to 
verify and ask for the version of, of, of anybody that you're going to mention in, in your story. Um, there's another discussion, but we this one is already solved. We are not using, using Flash anymore, and so we're basically using JavaScript and HTML5 uh, for to develop the applications. And, and the last one is how to, to keep the information updated. Uh, and as, as I mentioned before, we have been uh, dealing with the public institutions in order to have um, contracts and agreements to have the information in real time. But uh, that's only part of, of, of the information. The rest we have to basically go and ask, ask for, the, for the data again. And um, thanks very much. <laughs>
two years and a half ago. Great. More, more questions for Janina? Um, is there any cooperation you've had with, uh, you mentioned um, sort of, uh, police intelligence uh, or other who have worked in this field longer? Did you have any cooperation with them? No, well, what happened, I, like five months ago, I received a call from the intelligence guy, the, the chief of the intelligence department, and I was really concerned about that call, but he basically heard about what we are been doing, and so he they visit, visited us uh, to see what, um, they wanted us to help them to create something like that in the intelligence department, <laughs> yes, but it, it was not a problem. Uh, another question back there. Can you please repeat the name of the tool that you are using? It has been a bit hard to hear here. Okay, sorry. Uh, I mentioned many, many tools, but the one for for analyzing the data. for analyzing uh, I two I two. It's a British company. Well, it's now owned by Microsoft, but it used to be. It was developed by Scotland Yard, and then um, it's owned by Microsoft. And at, at the beginning, it was only uh, allowed to uh, it, to sell to law enforcement agencies. And actually, I think we were the, the first journalists to have this this tool because it was not it was not easy. I mean, they investigate you for months, and then they they sell you the product. You also said it was really quite expensive. So, are there any other tools? Maybe open source and free tools that you use that you could recommend. Yeah, well, these not exactly like this one, but uh, I mean you can do the same thing you, using SQL, um, but not the same. The, the thing with this software is that object oriented, so you can visualize your queries. Uh, it's very easy, easy to use for journalists. That's the reason why we we decided to use this one. I've been trying two more. Uh, <clears throat> tools, but uh, I'm not pretty sure that are kind of the same. And my dream is to, I mean, we are, we've been talking about developing something like this, but for reporters. Because this is really, or, um, this is for policemen and prosecutors, I mean, it, even the, the, the symbols, everything you see there, it's uh, uh, developed and designed for that. Well, if you develop that tool, then you can sell it to most newsrooms, and that's a new business model for you. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Johannes. I'm, I'm still puzzled by this. I don't know if I'm, actually this might be just my lack of, uh, of knowledge, but I, I don't actually know any other news organization which is doing this uh, kind of journalism where you actually first collect the data and then try to find like connections to it later on, basically not having any idea. I mean, does anybody, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you as, as well, but I'm, I'm just asking first, first the crowd, does anybody know here that somebody has been doing Finland? Where, where? It was in the US. Yeah. In Seattle. In Seattle Times. In Seattle Times. Okay. You see. The Swedish broad. We have public broadcasting company, Their Swedish arm is doing something called Marktbas, and which is something something similar to this. And we we are do we are as well in Helsinki so doing something similar. It's not public yet, and we don't know if it'll. Make it public, yeah. 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 We're doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions for Janina? I'm not actually interested about hearing Mikko's opinion about the, the whole, like, getting all kinds of data which is linked to a, a some kind of private operation. Do you think there's a risk even though data is kind of open? <laughs> No, not really. I mean, there's two different things. In, in, in Finnish language, we often confuse tieto suoja with tieto turva, which is, in English, it's security and privacy. There's no security problems here. There might be privacy issues. I mean, if, if the databases are too far reaching, maybe. But everything here is open source. Everything you have is public. So if it really is supposed to be public, no, I don't see any problem. Yeah, hey. Any more questions? 
If not, then uh, let's give a big hand to Janina. And uh, do stay on and talk to each other and all that. And um, uh, join our Meetup page. It's on uh, at meetup.com. H H Helsinki Hacks and Hackers Helsinki at Meetup, and uh, you will find out about our future events. And uh, we'll be back. We'll be back in January, either here or, or at uh, Press of Google. Yeah, thanks.